O oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you tonight that you have not left us to float around in a sea of hypothesis and supposition. But you have made a way, created a means by which you have spoken your truth to us. We need your word. We pray that we will listen carefully to this passage of scripture and take it to heart tonight. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, Psalm 119. I have been for some weeks uh, soaking in Psalm 119 along with some other passages of scripture <clears throat> and is often the case I, I come to a passage that I've, I know well and has spoken to my heart before <clears throat> but I always want to be cautious and careful that I don't overlook a verse because I know it read it again read it afresh let it speak to your heart and I tried to do that and I came to a verse in Psalm 119 that really spoke to me. I shared it with the staff Tuesday morning in our staff meeting. And I, I want to share it with you tonight. Uh, Psalm 119, 130, 176 verses in Psalm 119. This is verse 130. And I want to talk to you tonight under the heading of God's Word our light, God's word, our light. The verse reads thusly from the English Standard Version, the unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Now, how many of you would want to admit that you qualify as a simple person. I, I would put myself in that, in that category. We're all simpletons. And no matter how often we try to put on a facade that says we know something, that we really uh, are expert in this and that, really when it boils down to it, we need help. We need information. And we need to be taught what we need to know. Now, I'm just going to talk about verse 130 for a while before I give you my points. So, but I just think there's so much here. For example, um, there's this whole idea of divine truth that's behind this verse. Uh, the psalmist is talking about uh, facts information truth that comes from god he calls this your words he's speaking to god the unfolding of your words now that's really important on a number of levels which at the very least means that there is such a thing as truth outside of us we commonly call this objective truth that is truth that is not defined by subjective opinion now i run into people all the time who resist truth because they don't like it well <clears throat> i sometimes will think if i don't say it i don't care whether you like it or not it's still true uh, their uh, bumper sticker. Mo no one puts bumper stickers on their bumpers anymore. Thank the Lord. Uh, but the old bumper sticker, I believe. Uh, I believe the Bible. How, how, do, how does that go? The Bible says it. I believe it, and that settles it. Well, whether you believe it or not, that still settles. It. If the Bible says it, that settles it. So there's there's that understanding here. Behind, beyond, the word transcendence is what we use to refer to the beyondness. Uh, there is truth. 
Next, I want to point out that the verse talks about the importance of understanding that God has revealed his truth. Now, that doesn't mean God has revealed everything he knows. Because John would say, you know, he said, I didn't write down everything Jesus said. If we tried to write down everything Jesus said and did, the whole world couldn't contain it. That's what John said. There is truth beyond revealed truth. But God has revealed truth to us. Your words, the unfolding of your words gives light. So God is, is giving revelation. Now, when I use the word revelation, I'm not talking about the book entitled Revelation, although the title of that book is about the unveiling of God's truth. So here you have the idea that there is objective truth, that objective truth is divine truth, and that objective divine truth is revealed, and he adds, in language. Notice again what he says. The unfolding of your what? Words. The ESV has that in plural. Do you see that? Okay. That's not the collective noun. Sometimes we'll see your word, which really means all the word of God. But here it's plural, and it suggests that he's talking about, surprisingly, words. Your words, what words? Well, it's the language, it's the, uh, how many of you miss grammar in school? I'm not sure when they quit teaching grammar. I, 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 some people, I, I don't think they went to grammar school, but grammar is important. It's syntax, grammatical construction. The, the, the structure of language, God has revealed his word in words constructed by language a lady came to me one time she said uh, god spoke to me i said well tell me about that she said i drove home drove in the driveway i looked up i saw a cloud and it looked like an angel and i said to myself she was telling me that I, and i said god is speaking to me uh-huh god is not going to speak to you in a cloud He's not going to speak to you through a tree. Moses heard a burning bush one time, but that, that was unique. But he speaks in his word, the Bible, in the words contained therein. That's why we talk about Bible study. It's taking the words and making sense. And then there's this idea of unveiling. That brings to mind hermeneutics. What is hermeneutics? It's the interpretation of God's words. Here, the unveiling of your words gives me light. So, as Paul would say, we need to rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, there's a second line to the first after the first line. And this is a parallel construction. Uh, we talk about Hebrew parallelism, uh, the writing in Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew will often use a second st a statement or a sentence to connect it to the first sentence to make a point. I think the second sentence is, is carrying beyond, in a logical fashion, what he means in the first sentence about giving light. The unfolding of your words gives light, then ESV puts a semicolon. It, what's the antecedent of it? The unfolding, right? The unfolding of your words gives light. It, the unfolding, imparts understanding. Understanding to the simple. Understanding is, the, is knowing how to apply the wisdom of God. It's taking what you know, and it's knowing what to do with it. That's understanding. Okay. So, now, that's my expositional handling of this verse. Now, let me, I'm leaving my introductory point or section and talking about two aspects of what he's saying here. And then we'll apply it 
can be done. The first thing that needs to be seen, I think, that is that is core, foundational to this verse, is he is asserting a factual need for divine revelation. He is asserting a factual need for divine revelation. We think we know more than we really know. What did Jesus say when the devil tempted him? He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Uh, when you go back to Psalm 119 and you read through it, you find one of the themes that, that pulls it all together is this idea of how precious and how valuable the word of God is. He'll say things like, it's, it's more to be treasured than silver and gold. If you have the word of God and you have gold, which do you want? The psalmist said, I'll take the word of God. It's more precious than silver and gold. Sometimes he talks about it's sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. I don't know about you, but I do have a sweet tooth. It's an issue in my life. I have to handle that best I can. Sweet. Honey is sweet. The honeycomb. Get that honey with the honeycomb in it. You just, it's chewy. And doesn't that just taste good on a biscuit? Psalmist said, but God's word is sweeter still than honey in the honeycomb. He's, he's telling us something about how he views God's revelation. This revelation is absolutely needed. And we could play with this all day. Let me just simply say a number of things about that. I, I guarantee you that without the word of God, we are in deep, deep trouble as a country. If we as a nation say to God, we don't want your Bible, we don't want your gospel, we don't want your teaching, we don't want your truths, then we are, whether we know it or not, agreeing to embrace darkness at its deepest level and all the consequences that go with that. We were talking talk to someone on the phone today and we were talking about what's going on. I mean, I've said this before, I'll say it again. It's like so many people took a stupid pill. They don't even think. And, and not only that, but you can lie to them and and they'll believe whatever you tell them, or there's minds made up. You could tell them the truth, and all the truth that you tell them, they will not believe the truth because their mind's already made up. What is wrong with people today? I say again, we need God's word, and we're in deep, deep trouble without God's word. He's making an assertion here that we have a factual need for divine revelation. I, I, I could talk about, I'm not going to take the time. Not only is our humanity limited, our epistemological limitations are severe. We never know everything there is to know because we're human. But sin blinds us to the truth. And I'm going to, in a few weeks, I'm going to get down there to John 8, 44 where Jesus talks about the devil being a liar and a murderer. And, um, and he lies, and people believe the lie. They're blinded by it. The factual need for divine revelation. Second thing he says here is, is something for which we should give gratitude and thanksgiving to God. God has provided his revelation in his word to us. God has provided his revelation in his word to us. The thing we needed is what he has provided. There are two things he says here in this verse about that point. First, God's word is our light. Our light. We as Christians are not a people of darkness. We are a people of light. Because our God is a God of light. Isn't that great? We are not called to take a leap into the darkness. We are called to walk in the light. 
And again, in this same chapter, Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God has given his revelation in human language written down that we might understand it, unveil it, interpret it, that the word of God in the words he has put in his word gives us light in our life. Now, the most remarkable thing here, I think, is how comprehensive this idea is. The unfolding of your words gives light. There's no qualification. It gives understanding to the simple. No qualification. I think there's a point to be made here. Let me remind us. If we in our minds go back to Joshua chapter 1. Moses has died. Joshua is the new leader. And Joshua just wasn't sure he was ready for that. And God spoke to Joshua. Now, Joshua's got to be a general. Joshua's got to be an administrator. We got to feed all these people. We got to get them water. We got to organize them. God wants me to lead this bunch into the, into the land. He's got a big job to do. What does God say to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1? He desperately needs above all things to do all of that. He says, be strong and courageous. And everything Moses has taught you, make sure you elevate that in your own life. And then he would say, he said, meditate on the law of God both day and night. That you may be prosperous and have success. That leads me to say here that there is no success in any category of life if you deny God's word. That has economic ramifications. That has educational ramifications. It does, you can't find a lot of economics here, but what's said here affects economics. And if we deny God's word, God's word is a lamp unto our feet. We have chosen a dark path. God's word puts us in such a place where we can relate to reality. And by the way, I think that's why so many people are going nuts. I think insanity is rampant. Because once you turn from God, you automatically become insane in some fashion. And the longer you go away from God, the worse it gets until wrong seems right and right seems wrong and you don't know what's up and you don't know what's down. We need God's word and God has provided his word. His word is a lamp, is a light for our path. The second thing he says in God's provision of revelation of his word is his word is our light. Then he says, the unveiling of God's word gives understanding. And I think the word understanding in the second line is a commentary on the word light in the first line. What is light? It's understanding. It's I, I come to understand some things. What is the core of life? What is the point of life? What is the meaning of life? How does everything relate to the core? This country used to know the answers to those questions. Now no one knows the answer. Once we, once we sucked out the core truth of God's word, we left a gap, an empty spot. And now you've got to take human ideas and shove it in there and make everybody believe it. You say, Pastor, it seems like you're saying we need God's word for this country to work right. That's exactly what I'm saying. And that's true of anything else. Family, a church, a person's life. It's this unveiling of his word that gives understanding to us and we need understanding. Application. Two things I want to say in application. The first is, um, is a deduction made on the, the points that I've been trying to make here. And that is this. We study God's word, the Bible, 
to understand God's mind. Now, let me just let that soak in a minute. We study the Bible, God's word, the Bible, in order to understand God's mind. What, what if I could tell you that there is a book available to you that if you read it and you study it and you think on it and, and you grasp it, you could think God's thoughts with him. Would you be excited about that? That's Bible study. This is God taking his thoughts and putting it into narratives and poet, poetry and proverbs and prophecy and laws and commands and, and all kinds of things. But I'm, I'm going to insist that God is saying one thing throughout all of that. And don't get hung up on the periphery if you don't know what the main thing is. Po folks will come up and say, what do you think Ezekiel means about, you know, I, I don't care, I don't know. I took Ezekiel in seminary. And regretted it. Ezekiel's a book in the Bible, and it's true. Everything it says is true. But so is First Chronicles chapters 1 through 9. But I don't recommend you read that for your devotional reading. So-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so so -and -so begat. But you get the point. That's not there for devotional reading. It's there for historical investigation of genealogical study. What got me off on that? I have no clue. My point is, you can get lost in, in the details. We sometimes say it, don't get lost in the weeds. You understand what I'm saying? You could go into the weeds and you're missing the point. You can't see the forest for the trees. God has spoken and he is saying one driving, passionate, Reality. I, God, have acted redemptively in human history, and that redemptive action is found in my Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Him. By the way, that's almost a quote of what God said to Peter when He said, Let's build three tabernacles. He's a church planter, you see. And God said, Hush, listen to Jesus. That's, that's what He's saying in all through Scripture. We must study the Bible to understand God's mind on this subject. And second, the application is the results that come from experiencing God's light in the scriptures. Now, I'm going to give you four results that I think comes from walking in the light of the scripture and, and coming to grasp and understand what he's saying. And um, I think this would be natural. I think it's validated in other passages of Scripture. But I'm going to say four results will occur. One, peace and assurance. Peace and assurance. Uh, my friend and I were talking on the phone today, and he asked me a question. He said, have you ever done a study about, about how Christians are aliens and strangers and pilgrims that do not belong on this earth? And I said, you know, I've thought about that a lot. I've incorporated that concept a lot in other things. I've, I think I probably need to teach my people on that subject. You and I don't belong here. And you should feel alien to this culture. You should feel alien to this place. You are meant for something better. So. How do people walk their whole lives in a strange environment and have peace and assurance? We're not home. Well, I think the word of God gives that to us. God has spoken. How many, I, I won't stay here long, but how many times have you or I opened this word when we were hurting and it spoke to us? Peace and assurance. That's one thing. Number two, confidence and courage. I don't mean arrogance. I'm not saying arrogance. Christians should not be arrogant, but we should be confident. 
and courageous. Again, go back to Joshua. Be strong and courageous, Joshua. I know you don't feel like you're up to it, but you got to be strong. You got to be courageous. We need to be humble, but we must not be timid. We must know what we know and know it well. People need the church to speak with a clear voice from the word of God. Don't play the game. Speak the message. Confident. Courageous. Third, strength and steadfastness. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, the scripture says. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Listen, if the Lord had told you 30 years ago, this is what you're going to go through. What would you have said? I quit. I wilt. I can't do that. Listen, God's going to meet us at every turn through his word, speaking through his word, talking to us about his word. And that word will give us steel to keep us going. God has spoken. Strength and steadfastness. And finally, enduring hope. Enduring hope. Hope to be hope must endure. Paul would say it like this. If I have what I hope for, I don't need to hope for it anymore. Hoping means you ain't got it yet. I was reading Hebrews 11. And he said, these all died in faith. God said he would do this. And they died and he hadn't done it yet. Why? Because God had a plan to include you and me in what he was doing. Enduring hope. Hope that keeps us going. All of this relates to what he says here. The unfolding of your words gives light, gives understanding to the simple. So I think we all need to make a decision here. I got to stop. What are we going to do with the Bible? You're going to read it. You're going to study it. You're going to hear Bible sermons. You're going to soak your mind. Meditate on the word of God. You're a wise person if you're going to do that. If, you, if your Bible is dusty, you're a fool. Because this is the book where God speaks to people who will pay attention. Dear God, help us. To be passionate about getting your word right. In this church, in our families, in our lives. Help us to walk in the light of your word. In Jesus' name we pray.